Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Well, welcome. Welcome one and all to the somewhat newly branded uh, show uh, every other Monday at noon at this time uh, on this very station. Uh, Energy 808, the cutting edge, is uh, our new name, and that includes uh, me, Marco Mangelsdorf, President of uh, ProVision Solar and uh, Director of Hawaii Island Energy Cooperative, and uh, Jay Fidel, who isn't with us today, and sometimes uh, Mina Morita, former chair of the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission, a longtime house rep from the beautiful Garden Isle in the Hanalei area. And today I feel very, very honored and pleased whenever I can get my friend uh, Ted Peck from uh, Holu Energy, CEO of Holu Energy, and all around brilliant and good guy to join us uh, to discuss cutting edge energy topics in uh, the beautiful uh, Aloha State. So uh, thank you so much, Ted, for joining us again. It's always fun to get wonky with you, Marco. <laughs> it's a good time. Yes, there, there aren't that many people, uh, I think, in our state uh, to really go down into true the depths of wonkdom, and uh, that's something I will always appreciate with, uh, with you, Ted. So. We have a number of, uh, I think, worthwhile topics to talk about today. And uh, the first, because uh, it uh, continues to be in the news and uh, figuratively and literally a hot topic, is uh, Puna Geothermal Venture, which mm -hmm. is a geothermal power plant that's been operating on the Big Island for about 25 years, started 1993, although the beginnings of PGV actually started in the early 1980s in terms of uh, number of parties looking into geothermal in different parts of the Big Island and finally went online after much protest uh, in 1993, and it's had a heck of a run. And as of early May, with um, fissures uh, 1 through 24 or 26, I think we're up to now in terms of the eruption, which is ongoing, uh, approaching the uh, the 88-day mark, which I believe was the last uh, eruption run in 1960, I think it was. Uh, the power plant has been offline, and I've been giving it some thought, as a number of other people have, in terms of the prospects for it coming back online and under what conditions. So with that uh, intro and preamble, I'd like to get your take, Ted, in terms of what do you think should be done uh, regarding PGV? Let's assume, for the sake of assumptions, that the plant essentially is intact, uh, will remain intact after the eruption stops. Right now it's surrounded on three sides by uh, lava and is only pretty much accessible by helicopter. But let's say that Madame Pele doesn't raise uh, the, the plant to the ground or cover with lava. If it remains relatively intact and after the eruption stops, what do you think should be our course regarding PGV? Well, I'll preface this by saying that uh, neither you nor I are really the decision makers. There's, there's really, in to my understanding, uh, two decision makers. Ormat's got to decide what they're going to do. You know, they have an existing PPA, and of course, Helco, with the PUC's oversight, has to make a decision. Um, it's really hard to opine while the lava is still flowing. You know, I was just looking last night at uh, the river. You know, there's a, literally a river uh, going, you know, over the rise past that facility. Um, and until that river stops flowing, it's, it's really difficult to say what needs to be done. And frankly, because, you know, one of the challenges that Helco has always had is that they just have there's a lot of energy on that grid. They've never been, you know, this is one of the reasons why, you know, your home island utility has been a little recalcitrant about adding more renewable resources because they, they really have an abundance of energy sources. So, and what that means is with uh, PGV down, um, Hamaku Energy Partners and the other fossil plants have no problem filling in the gap. Now, that does mean, even though there's still secure energy, 
Uh, I think that that's going to mean, you know, and time will tell, but I think that that's going to mean that your composite rate is going to go up on your island, at least for the time being, uh, because, you know, the, the sources that are replacing that power plant in the immediate are fossil-based, which means they're going right. to be more highly, uh, more, more, more expensive. Uh, or Matt, I'm sure has insurance on the facility. I'm sure an option that is in the realm of what they could do. And I've read all that you know Mike has said that they're going to do and their level of commitment, and that's all understandable and commendable. Uh, Ormat ha and and PGV have been very committed to not just to that facility but to the island. You know they are really neighbors for the Big Island, and, and I think that they're a good corporate neighbor from everything I've seen from when I was a state energy administrator to up including you know recent times. But there is, uh, I think, an opportunity here if Ormat decides that um, it's just time to go, they have that ability, that option is there. They could declare that, um, that facility a total loss take the insurance money and, and, and exit the state if they so choose to do, I would think. And I've been digging um, a bit deeper myself into the contract between Helco and PGV. There were amendments that were done to the contract uh, through um, approved by the PUC back in 2011, which allows Helco to purchase uh, more starting in 2011, more megawatts worth of geothermal uh, compared to the prior contract, which I believe, uh, believe it or not, goes back all the way 32 years to 1986. And you mentioned that, you know, that ORMAT could conceivably at any given time say, we're out of here, we'll cash out on the insurance, which I believe is up to $100 million, not chump change by any means. And I think, i got to believe, without having the document in front of me, the actual PPA, that Helco could also cancel the contract at some point, perhaps as early as right now, if they so chose, because uh, certainly there has been a non-performance on the part of Warmat providing megawatts to Helco. Again, that's speculation on my part. I but can't imagine I'm, that's a, that's in every PPA. I can't imagine that and, you know the the time frame of non-performance varies, but that's that's boilerplate of every power purchase agreement. Absolutely. Right. Yes. Right, and to what extent is, there's been discussion at Helco and or HECO uh, about that is probably premature because, uh, as we both know, the, the lava flow is continuing. But let me ask you uh, from one walk to another. I did a little bit of digging over the weekend, and a report that Helco filed to the, the PUC early in January, which all the HECO companies, and I believe KIUC, has to do as well, is they're essentially reporting to the commission what their generating reserve margin is as far as peak demand over the previous calendar year versus total maximum uh, ability of the grid of, uh, of either utility-owned and IPPs, independent power producers' ability to generate maximum amount of power. So with that preamble, with PGV's 34.6 megawatts, as, as noted in this particular document, the firm generating reserve margin was 45% for Helco, 45%. Well, that drops to 27% with the loss of PGV. And my wonky question to you, my wonky friend, is what margin, where, where is that line drawn in terms of enough reserve, uh, generating reserve margin versus you start to kind of uh, munch on, your, on your, your fingernails worrying that maybe this is not enough reserve. Where, where's that kind of line, do you know? That's a, that's a great question, and I, and I have to confess I don't know um, what the normal number is uh, on, on a, say, a continental grid um, versus an island grid. Um, island grids, you know, it's a, uh, it would be an itch interesting to see if there's a study done and how much excess generation um, beyond peak, right? That's really not, not just, it's beyond your annual peak, not just beyond your, your normal daily peak, right? Right. So even, uh, but it's 
one of the reasons I think uh, that contributes to the high cost of electricity in Hawaii is the fact that we do carry a higher amount of excess. And really, it's the N minus one minus one, right? If you, you want to have enough excess so that if you have a generator down for maintenance, uh, you know, your largest generator down for maintenance, and then your next largest generator has a failure, that you still can meet load without rolling blackouts. And even on this island, I don't think you've really had it on your island as much where the utility will announce, maybe you correct me if I'm wrong, but on Oahu, we've had the utility say, hey, there's gonna be brownouts today because simply, you know, AES, which is our largest generator, is, da um, is down for maintenance and another generator had a failure. So we have rolling brownouts, which is really a way to, for the utility just to kind of uh, share the wealth, right? Share the pay. Right. Um, so, you know, 27% is uh, how good of a number that is or not is really more dependent upon how chunky that existing firm generation is rather than what the percentage is. Uh, right. And what that does say is that it, it's, you know, there's a trade-off uh, you, if you have bigger generators, you can, you know, at least notionally get more, uh, get a lower price of energy out of it. But smaller generators um, are now becoming more competitive, and smaller generators, uh, especially like uh, combustion turbine generators, are also a better fit to a renewable environment where you've got a lot of variability. Understood. So well, I'll bet you, and that 27% uh, like is uh, to that 20, uh, a station I'm sorry. break. So uh, we'll be back with more provocative wonk oh. to wonk questions in just a few minutes, just uh, momentarily. Okay. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king, come bang on your chest. You can be the world. Talk to God, go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock. You can move a mountain, you can break rocks. You can be a master, don't wait for luck. Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Okay, we're back. Marco and Ted, two of the wonkier people uh, when it comes to uh, talking away about energy here in the uh, Aloha 808 energy scene. So I just wanted to mention, Ted, for, for the sake of comparison, that the reserve margin, uh, as stated to the commission uh, for HECO, for the island you're on, is 41%. I should say was 41% mm -hmm. in 2017. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you uh, a provocative question which is, if, if it was your call as president of HELCO, as far as what to do regarding uh, PGV once the, the lava stops, uh, stops the flowing, so to speak. So let's, let's frame this properly. Right now, the way the contract has been in terms of purchasing Puna Geothermal uh, megawatts, uh, the first 25 megawatts produced have been if I'm not mistaken, at the avoided contract rate, which is the wholesale rate pegged to the cost of oil. So in right. other words, as oil goes up, uh, PGV makes more money, and it's almost kind of windfall-like because... Uh, and it's been uh, like that since the to... 80s. That's from the beginning. Is I'm it, sorry? That's, it's been like that from the beginning of the contract. It was at 30 megawatts avoided cost, which, you know, at the beginning of this, it seemed like a good idea but clearly, as you know, geothermal should be a low-cost, stable-cost 
source. And so the addition of that eight megawatts was under the condition that some of the original 30 would also be at a lower fixed cost. So that's why it moved to 25. Right, so that in 2011, the PPA was amended, and uh, apparently it brought down that amount of megawatts paid for at avoided cost to 25 megawatts, right. with right. with a, an additional uh, 10 or 15 up to as high as 40 plus uh, would be payable at a lower fixed cost, which is a benefit to the ratepayers. So my provocative question to you is, and it's kind of a leading one, why not, if you are head of Helco, cancel PGV and seek multi-megawatt renewable energy projects similar to what KIUC has done with storage in the 10 or 11 cents or less range per kilowatt hour uh, that would be a fixed cost that would be of greater benefit to, to the ratepayers. Why be stuck? to a contract with a power producer that is unable to deliver at a rate that is, uh, comparatively speaking, disadvantageous for the 83,000 or so rate pairs in the Big Island? Well, it's hard as what you set up. It's, it's incomplete. So let me, I'm going to put myself in Jay's shoes for a moment, uh, but I'll first stipulate I am not Jay nor am I Alan, uh, nor am I the commission. So there's a lot of different ways people are gonna think about this. But if I were in that position, uh, I would sit down with Mike and the ORMAT leadership and I'll say, look, um, we want to drive down our base cost. You know, we have an opportunity here because you're gonna be getting some insurance money um, to recapitalize this facility uh, your technology that you've currently employed, you know, some of it's new, but a lot of it's dated. Uh, so, you know, there's an opportunity for a technology refresh, and it's going to be based on insurance money. So how about we move more of that generation into a fixed lower rate? That's what I would negotiate, is moving from 25 megawatts even to something, um, something lower, you know, uh, maybe, you know, 10, 10 megawatts at the avoided uh, price, price um, of, you know, avoided cost vice uh, a fixed rate. And the reason why I say that is because, uh, and this is, you know, my opinion, I, I, if that plant gets shut down, then geothermal is gone from Hawaii's grids for, uh, probably a while, maybe a generation, maybe a really long time. I know there are people who would say, yay, can't we make that happen? I think that's a really foolish thing because as Richard Haw says, geothermal, is it's like we're sitting on a gold mine that can benefit the people of Hawaii. It could benefit the, the Hawaiian people, uh, and it just seems very foolhardy to just uh, walk away from it. So I, I would not be inclined to pull that lever and make PGV go away. I would find a way to drive down the cost of energy, um, using this as an opportunity um, to get geothermal at a lower price rather than an opportunity to kill geothermal. There will be those, and I know there are those who you see this as an opportunity to kill geothermal, and I don't wish them well in that pursuit. So uh, to make sure I'm understanding you correctly, Ted, what I'm hearing is you're advising, uh, and I'll play my, my, my J, I'll channel J right now. If you were King, uh, King Ted, you would go for a revise and amend approach to the existing power purchase agreement uh, with uh, Pune Geothermal Venture and ORMAT. I would. Okay. Okay, great. Well, let's move from the heat, figuratively and literally, of, uh, of uh, the East Rift Zone of the Big Island and move to uh, the microgrid docket. What can you tell me uh, about the microgrid docket, which is uh, not too long ago opened by the commission, and why should we care? That's a great question, and I think it's going to be fascinating to watch uh, why we should care. Um, Act 200 was signed by the governor last week, and within a day, the Public Utilities Commission uh, opened a docket 
uh, looking for interveners by the 30th of July. Uh, people who want to put together uh, or have a voice in putting together what a microgrid tariff might look like. The bill and the docket both really talked about um, just a few things. They talked about resilience, uh, and they talked about um, you know lowering lowering costs and basically new structures for being able to bring on renewables to benefit the grid. Um, you know, uh, Pete Rosig, who is a spokesman for HECO, he admonished in, in his comments in an article about it, said that, you know, we didn't want other ratepayers to have to pay for it. But I think that that's really a false construct, because the reality is, is that people today legally have the ability to, uh, to leave the grid, and they're growing in their technology ability to leave the grid. And so um, the, the real attractiveness to this from a policy perspective is that as these new technologies come on board, as people deploy them to meet their needs, a microgrid tariff is really a way to incentivize the, that new technology remaining on the grid and bringing grid capabilities so that you're really building the grid of the future rather than um, balkanizing your electricity load and um, taking it off the grid because they hit, the grid becomes inhospitable for new technology coming on the grid. How's that? That's a great answer. And I want to give a shout out to my friend Nicole Lowen, Representative Nicole Lowen, uh, who represents the Kona side. Uh, this was uh, a bill uh, that she strongly she supported, did. if not originated. So, yes. you know, kudos to Nicole. And where do you think, let's say, is the, the prime candidates to do some uh, initial on the ground uh, uh, testing of, uh, of a microgrid? I, 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 uh, I, the bill did mention. Um, um, uh, hell, uh, what's I always forget Nelha. Nelha, thank you. Uh, the the lab there in Kona. Um, I I really think that's the wrong construct because we don't need to have a pilot. The technology's there. We need to allow a thousand flowers to bloom. This is not something <laughs> that needs to be piloted. It just needs to be approved and moved out because the technology, as I said, is, is there. It is, it is available today. Uh, what we really need to do is remove barriers for people to bring on that technology on the grid. Taking a piloting approach, uh, all that does is, is really create barriers for people to deploy it operationally. So I don't like talking about this as, as a pilot. Well, little little did I know that you were going to channel your Mao Zedong by mentioning the uh, the the thousand, let a thousand flowers bloom. If I'm if I'm getting my history correct, no, you and my you are thought. you are. I, I I I wasn't thinking of it in that way. But yes, uh, the, the bottom line is we need to allow the market to move forward. How's that for a counterpoint to a Mao Zedong comparison? Yes, we need Very to good. we need to unleash the market because the market is ready to move. And we in Hawaii well, yeah. have uh, a, a, a pendant for constraining the market to our detriment. Yes. And we need to not do that. And yeah, that's you, you actually the reason why this, this bill and this docket exists is to do just that. If there is already a microgrid tariff, it's called Rule 14H. Yeah. We have been connecting microgrids to the grid using Rule 14H. There's nothing, if for a microgrid tariff to make sense, it has to be incentives for people to bring that to the grid, because otherwise right. they're not going to do it. We don't have a whole lot of time left, but I want to kind of continue with this thread a little bit further and continue to be my usual uh, uh, mischievous and provocative self here, Ted. What do you see as the uh, progression or likelihood of uh, grid defection or more and more grid defection in the near term? Let's say, let's call the near term the next 18 to uh, 36 months. Uh, it's, well, grid defection, I think, is a, um, a bit of a misleading term. Uh, I, would, I would use the term load defection. 
because what will happen is people will deploy these systems and then they will have the ability to take a load off the grid uh, temporarily when these systems are generating and not interconnect them to the, the grid. That's, that's uh, a potential today. And as long as that generation system doesn't connect to the grid, then there's, there's no reason, there's no requirement for interconnection. And you know, the, the switching of load is akin to turning on and off your water heater. It's very much allowed, you know, and, and if, if the, there are some utilities on the mainland that talk about having demand charges for residential units, meaning that you pay more for, you know, you basically, your cost gets shifted to either a fixed cost or based on your peak load on the grid. And I think that that's really a recipe for disaster. That's not really going to get the, if, if, if folks are thinking or the commission is thinking that that's a solution, I, I don't think that it's gonna result in the fruit that they're thinking it will result in. So really the right answer is, let's build a grid together that all these assets can work together. Um, I don't know, what do you think about that? And, and just to be, be clear for those, for those who don't know necessarily what a demand charge is, uh, as I understand it, essentially, you have utility ratepayer utility customer. Uh, typically, it's uh, on the mid to large commercial size, who are maintaining, who are paying a, a dollars per kilowatt uh, of, cons of peak demand that the facility is using, with the the notion that the utility has to maintain enough generating capacity to be able to meet the demand of, uh, of all its customers. And if you extend that to, to residential, then it's the same principle, right, that you have essentially all or most utility customers who are paying uh, a charge, a fee to the utility company in order for the utility company to be, be able to maintain an adequate amount of generation to meet all possible Demand. Do Marco, I have it right? Yeah, and the way I'll finish, we're short on time. The way I would finish this up, just today or yesterday, the federal government abandoned a case where they were trying to prosecute somebody who built a plastic gun for bypassing gun control laws. And, and the, the federal government abandoned it because it simply was a dead end. And so the, re, the challenge with trying to uh, legislate out innovation is that the only way you could do it is on a totalitarian basis, totalitarian basis. So the reality is, is no matter, it's like designer drugs. If you build something one way to try to achieve an outcome, the market is gonna innovate its way around that. And so it's just a bad, it's just a bad pathway to go down. Well, if you are, if, if you ever have a chance to become king, king of energy, Ted, I would be happy to offer my services uh, a la Lord of the Rings as uh, your Grima worm tongue. I don't even know what to say to that, Marco. <laughs> <laughs> well, what can I say except it's been, uh, it's great as always talking to you, Ted, and uh, I so appreciate our dialogue. And uh, from one, one wonk to another, uh, thank you so much for coming into the studio. Thanks for inviting one me. Of these one of these days, uh, you know, if the stars align correctly, we'll both be there together, and my goodness, what fun we'll have. It'll but, be a uh, great time. Meantime, I look forward to so it. Much. And blessings to Mina on her travels. And Jay. Thank you.